بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد uh, today we will finish up and conclude uh, with the incident of Hudaybiyah and uh, we will begin by quickly going over some of the main verses in the Quran in Surah Al-Fatih that go that mention uh, the uh, incident of Hudaybiyah and as I had said that Surah Al-Fatih came down in its entirety while the Prophet was going back from Hudaybiyah to Mecca. And this is one of those rare surahs that was revealed in its entirety. Usually, uh, the surah did not come down in its entirety. Sometimes the surah took seven, eight years to come down like Baqarah. It took over seven, eight years. In fact, you can even say it took nine years because the last verse of Baqarah was the last verse revealed. Surah Al-Fatih is one of those surahs. It came down wholesale, all of it, from beginning to end in one go. And uh, it came down neither in Mecca nor in Medina. And yet it is Madani because it came down after the Hijrah. So it is called uh, Madani even though physically it didn't come down in Medina. It came down on the way back to Medina. And unfortunately we do not have time to go over every single ayah. Uh, but I ask you to read the entire surah in the context of uh, our series in Hudaybiyah. And I'll just go over some of the main uh, ayat. Uh, and unfortunately again because of time I'll have to quote the English. And I really hate doing this because the Quran is only in Arabic. But translation is merely a translation. And so for the sake of time. Time, we'll just quickly quote some of the translated verses. Uh, so obviously uh, the first portion of the surah that surely we have given you a clear victory. Surely we have given you a manifest victory. Why have we done this? So that Allah may forgive your sins. Allah may forgive your sins, the past of them and those that will come. And He may perfect His favor upon you and keep you upon the right way. And that Allah Azza wa Jal help you with a mighty help. So, Allah is saying this treaty and this incident is one more way of showing your honor and of forgiving your sins. Now what has the Treaty of Hudaybiyah got to do with forgiving the sins of the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi Wasallam? The pain, the anguish, the grief that is caused is something that causes sins to be forgiven. And the Treaty of Hudaybiyah caused our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam some grief. Also, any honor and blessing that is given forgives sins. So this is a treaty that honor and blessing is being given to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then in verse number 5, and so that he may give the believing men and women Jannat and uh, and save them from their evil and indeed this is a great achievement with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah has given you this conquest, this fatah to forgive your sins and to cause the believers to enter Jannah. This is a blessing for you. It's a great victory for you. Then in verse number 10, surely those who give you the oath of allegiance, inna they give the oath to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're not giving it just to you. The hand of Allah is over their hand. Yadullahi fawqa aydihim. So Allah emphasizes that those who have given the bay'ah to Ridwan, they are giving the bay'ah directly to me. Then verse number 11, 12, uh, and 13, Allah mentions those who remain behind, the munafiqoon, that uh, when you go back to Medina, they will tell you, the Bedouins and the Arab, the Bedouins, the hypocrites will tell you, oh, we were busy because of our money and our children. So please ask Allah to forgive us. They say with their tongues what is not in their hearts. Rather, and Allah later on says, you thought that the Prophet ﷺ and the believers will never return to Medina. And that thought was made alluring to you. And indeed you had an evil thought and you were a people that were doomed to perish. So Allah exposes their excuse. Of course, there's so many miracles here because before the Prophet ﷺ returns to Medina, Allah tells him what the people will tell him. Before he gets back, Allah tells him, there's gonna يقولوا, they will say to you. And how did the Arab know what they would say, right? How did the, uh, uh, the Arab, they had not heard of the, uh, Surah Al-Fatah being recited, yet they quote Surah Al-Fatah without knowing they're quoting Surah Al-Fatah. That the Bedouins come and they give an excuse, they said, we're busy, it was harvest season, it was this and that. And of course, this is very similar to Tabuk that's going to happen in two years. But the, uh, the same point here, they gave an excuse. And Allah says, they say with their tongues what is not in their heart, rather they thought you would never come back. And what an evil thought. They thought the Quraysh would kill you. What an evil uh, thought. And 
uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then uh, mentions that in surah in verse number 18 لَقَدْ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذْ يُبَايُعُونَكَ تَحْتَ الشَّجَرَةِ That verily Allah is well pleased with the believers when they swore their allegiance to you from under the tree and Allah knew what was in their hearts. So Allah sent down peace upon them and rewarded them with a close victory. Notice the contrast. Allah knows the heart of the hypocrites. And Allah exposed their hearts. And Allah also said, the believers said something, and that is the oath of allegiance. And they meant it. So Allah knew what is in their hearts. And because of that, Allah sent down forgiveness. And Allah has given them a close promise, a near victory. What is this near victory? As we will mention, it is uh, the conquest of Khaybar. And in it, the Muslims got more booty and more uh, ghanima than they had ever gotten in any battle before uh, Khaybar. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that in verse 22 and 23, that if the Quraysh had actually fought you, kafru, suppose that the fighting had taken place, even then, even though you were numerically less, they were the ones who would have turned around and fled and they would have not found any protector. So Allah says, you were the brave people, you challenged them and they didn't fight even though there were more than you, but I will tell you, even if they fought, you would have remained and they would have fled. And this is another praise for the Ansar and the Muhajirun that Allah tells them of the future that will, is not going to happen. And this is of the interesting things. Allah knows the past, Allah knows the future, Allah knows the present, Allah knows the future that is not going to happen if it happens how it would happen this is also of the knowledge of Allah right Allah knows that future that will never happen but if it happened how it would happen because Allah Azza wa is predicting something that's not going to happen there was no battle in Hudaybiyah yet Allah says if you had fought them they would have turned around and fled and you would have remained on the battlefield and that's of course a blessing for them uh, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala criticizes them in verse number 25 they were the ones who rejected and disbelieved and turned you away from the sacred mosque and they also turned away the animals that were meant for the sacred mosque so Allah is criticizing the Quraysh. They prevented you and they prevented the charity from reaching uh, its destination and then were it not for believing men and believing women that you do not know about and you might have killed, were it not for them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have caused a battle to take place. Uh, I'm, I'm translating by meaning here. And the point here is Allah is saying in Makkah there are many Muslims. In Makkah there are many Muslims. They're persecuted. They're hiding their faith. And if there had been a battle, they would have been forced to be on the side of the Quraysh because their Islam is secret. And you would have been forced to kill them. And if you had killed them and later on discovered that they were Muslims, you would have felt great grief. And therefore it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that prevented this bloodshed from taking place. Even though you had conquered some of them. Remember there was an incident where the Muslims had conquered a small entourage. And despite this conquering, uh, the, uh, uh, they, they had submitted and they had surrendered without any blood being shed. And then in the final verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reaffirms the vision and the dream. لَقَدْ صَدَقَ اللَّهُ رَسُولَهُ رُؤْيَا بِالْحَقِّ That surely Allah has shown the true vision to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Allah has shown the true dream. You shall enter. لَتَدْخُلُنَّ There is an emphasis. You shall enter. The Masjid al-Haram, after having shaved or trimmed your hair, you will be in security, you shall not fear. And Allah knows what you do not know, so He brought about a near victory, Fathan Qariba, a major victory through this. So, you will get your Umrah, but you will also get a victory. And what is this victory? Some say this victory is the prediction of the conquest of Makkah. Allah knows best. And some say this is Khaybar again. Some say it was other victories, and we'll mention some of those victories today. And then the final two verses are verses that praise the Prophet ﷺ, and the famous phrase, Muhammadur Rasulullah, which only occurs twice in the Quran, La ilaha illallah, the phrase uh, in that way occurs once, and then the phrase Muhammad Rasulullah in this particular manner it occurs twice. And this is one of those two times Muhammad Rasulullah, that the Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, and then the rest of the verse is a praise for the Ansar and the Muhajirun, those who are with him. They are strict against the kuffar and they are compassionate amongst the believers. You will see them bowing down, prostrating, seeking the pleasure of Allah. They have 
prostration marks on their faces from the effects of the sujood. And then Allah Azza wa goes on and praises the Sahaba in this manner. And by the way, not really related to Hudaybiyah, but uh, the last verse, chapter, uh, so the last verse of Surah Fatah, which is verse 29, it is one of the uh, one of only two verses in the Quran in which every single letter of the Arabic alphabet exists. It's just a little bit of a trivia point here. Every single letter of the Arabic alphabet occurs in this uh, verse. There's only one other verse like that. In any case, uh, just a brief summary of Surah Al-Fatih. Now today, for the rest of today, we're really going to do the main lessons and the benefits from the incident of Hudaybiyah. And we begin, we'll divide this into four sections. Firstly, benefits from the seerah. Secondly, theological benefits. Thirdly, fiqh benefits. And then fourthly, modern political thought benefits, right? So we divide this into four sections. Firstly, seerah benefits. As for the seerah benefits, of the greatest benefits is that it forced the Quraysh to treat the Muslims like an equal party. Because treaties are only enacted between two equals. Otherwise, it's a command and it's a haughty arrogance. But for the first time, the Quraysh and the Prophet are brought to the table as equals. And therefore, this is demonstrating that the Muslims are not only gaining assent, eventually they will gain the upper hand. And therefore, another point here in the seerah, that the, some of the Quraysh, many of them maybe, realize that the tide is turning. And it was this realization that made them so paranoid, so crazy, that they said, whatever happens, you're not going to enter this year. Let not the Arabs say that you had the upper hand over us. What does that show? It shows that they did have the upper hand, right? But there is this arrogance, you know, when you're just stubbornly arrogant. You don't care what anybody says, right? It doesn't matter. They've reached that paranoia now. They've reached that level that people are going to say you're more powerful, so whatever happens, you're not going to enter Mecca. In that, we notice their insecurity. We notice they realize the table is turning, and as the table is turning, some of them, those who were the closest to Islam, this was the final straw that they needed in order to embrace Islam. And very soon, we will come to the last converts before the conquest of Mecca, culminating with Khalid ibn al-Walid and Uthman ibn Abi Talha and Amr ibn al-As. It was the Treaty of Hudaybiyah that was really the last straw for these people that they realized that there is no way that this religion is going to diminish and disappear. It is the truth. And they needed to see some of them their Iman was not as quick as Abu Bakr. They needed to see signs. And Hudaybiyah was the final sign that they needed to see before they embraced Islam. Also of the benefits in the seerah is that this peace brought about for the Muslims a comfort and security that they had never felt before. Badr, Uhud, Khandaq, these are all fresh. And there's always this fear, when will the Quraysh attack again? What will the next battle be? But now that the Treaty of Hudaybiyah is enacted, this brings about a psychological sense of peace, of calm. And that peace and calm allows them to concentrate on other issues that they did not have the luxury to concentrate on before Hudaybiyah. First and foremost, the issue of the remaining uh, Yehudi tribes, and that is in Khaybar now. And that's exactly why less than one month after Hudaybiyah, Khaybar takes place. Because there is a big thorn and that's the Banu Nadir and the, and the remnants of the Banu Qaynuqa still causing issues. And they need to be dealt with. But as long as we're the threat of the Quraysh, as long as we have other issues, we can't you know, have the luxury to deal with Khaybar. Because Khaybar, as we will study from next week, inshallah, onwards, that was a fortress. And it's going to require a lot of work. Who has the time and the energy to dedicate when we're worried about the Quraysh? Now that the Quraysh is taken care of, we can concentrate on the other uh, uh, threat. And that was the threat of the Banu Nadir and the remnants of the Banu Nadir. Also, this peace allowed for the very first time the Prophet ﷺ to start thinking globally now. Or maybe acting globally is a better term. Obviously, he's thinking globally from day one. So to start acting globally. Now that the local threat has been eliminated for the very first time, now... Uh, Hudaybiyah takes place uh, in the seventh year uh, and now in the next year of the Hijrah the Prophet is going to start writing letters to the leaders. He writes letters to at least a dozen and we'll talk about the letters in one lecture or maybe even two. And so for the very first time the Prophet begins writing letters to international leaders because Quraysh is now finally 
yeah, we can we can deal with this. It's something that's bottled up. So we have now the opportunity to look global and to look beyond this. This also shows us that the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, it gave or it affirmed the sense that the Muslim Ummah is now an independent republic. That it can negotiate now with the Caesar, with Kisra, with Muqawqis. The Prophet is writing letters as a political leader now. And Hudaybiyah either affirmed or it simply added to that an aura of the Muslims being an independent political uh, entity. Also, one of the greatest blessings of Hudaybiyah, perhaps the greatest seerah blessing, is that it allowed for the first time Muslims and pagans to interact without fear of bloodshed. Throughout the Arabian Peninsula, it allowed Muslims and pagans, idol worshippers, to engage in buying, in selling, in traveling, in mixing with one another, and this allowed the message of Islam to spread peacefully. And this obviously caused many people to convert, and so Hudaybiyah was not a jihad of the sword, it was a jihad of peace and a jihad of da'wah. And frankly, the jihad of peace and the jihad of da'wah was far more effective in terms of converts than any jihad of war. Because you're not going to convert people by the sword. But you will convert people by persuasion, by talking about your theology. And what happens when you have peace? You can talk about your religion. And uh, Ibn Shihab al-Zuhri, uh, and if you remember Ibn Shihab al-Zuhri is the most famous scholar of the Tabi'un, died 124 Hijrah, and clearly he is the one of the main architects of our fiqh and our seerah and our usul, really one of the main bastions of, of Sunnism, Ibn Shihab al-Zuhri, but we don't know much about him in terms of masses because he didn't write a separate book like like Bukhari or others, that was before his time. But we owe everything, really, uh, in terms of Islamic academics to Ibn Shahab al-Zuhri. Ibn Shahab al-Zuhri said, there was no victory given to Islam before Hudaybiyah that was bigger than Hudaybiyah. There was no victory given to the Muslims before Hudaybiyah than Hudaybiyah. Why? He said, this was Ibn Shahab speaking, that the people were all at peace with one another. So they would mix and talk and mention Islam. And so... Not a single intelligent person heard about Islam except that he entered it. And, this is still him commenting, in the next two years after Hudaybiyah, the number of Muslims doubled or even more than this. Islam had been preaching its message for 16 years. No, 19 years. 13 plus 6. 19 years it is preaching its message. And in two years after Hudaybiyah, the number of converts doubles from the 13 years pre-Hudaybiyah. Think about that. And Ibn Hisham, who's Ibn Hisham? Who's Ibn Hisham? Come on, guys. The story, the Sira guy. What did he do? Ibn Hisham. He know he didn't write the Sira. He copied whose? Ibn Ishaq, very good. He summarized and edited Ibn Ishaq. This is now standard, you guys should know this, right? Ibn Hisham quotes Az-Zuhri, and then he says, the proof for az zuhri statement is that in Bay'at al-Ridwan, there were 1,400 people. Two years later, in the conquest of Mecca, there are 10,000 people. So all you have to do is look at the numbers. That the bulk of the Muslims of Medina, not all of them, the bulk of them participated in Udwan. That's 1,400 men. In the conquest of Mecca, where did these 8,000, 9,000 extra come from? They have converted in the last two years. That is what Ibn Hish uh, Hisham is saying. All you have to do is to look at the numbers. So this shows us that a peace treaty might actually be a far bigger a victory than a military endeavor. And of course, of the, of the points uh, and the, uh, of the benefits of Sira of Hudaybiyah, is that Hudaybiyah is a blessing and a status for those who participated in it. As I mentioned two weeks ago, that the Prophet ﷺ said to the people of, of Hudaybiyah, Antum khayru ahlil ard, you are the best people on earth. And in another hadith, he said, No one who gave me the bay'ah will ever enter the fire of hell. And of the final benefits of the Sira from Hudaybiyah is that Hudaybiyah was a direct line to the conquest of Mecca. Without Hudaybiyah, you cannot have the conquest of Mecca, as we will see when we get to the conquest of Mecca. It was the treaty of Hudaybiyah that allowed the Prophet ﷺ to engage in a military expedition when the Quraysh did not live up to their side. 
And therefore, had it not been for Hudaybiyah, there would be no conquest of Mecca. So, inna fatahna laka fatha mubina, there was a very clear victory. Now, second stage, theological benefits. For those who came late, we said there's going to be four stages of benefits. Sira benefits, theological benefits, fiqh benefits, modern political science benefits. Theological benefits, very quickly, because we've done most of these before, but just to reiterate. Of the theological benefits, Ibn al-Qayyim writes, and Ibn al-Qayyim, by the way, is one of the greatest masters of extracting benefits from the seerah. Hardly anybody has done that type of analysis that Ibn al-Qayyim has done, and that is to really think about the seerah and then extract points of benefits, and I hope that, inshallah, I'm following in that footsteps to, to really examine every episode, every incident, and extract what you can extract. So Ibn al-Qayyim, and he did this, he does this in his book, Zad al-Ma'ad, which is in five volumes, it's a great book, and it uh, has an entire section about uh, benefits from the seerah. So Ibn al-Qayyim says that of the benefits from Hudaybiyah, has a long section, of the benefits, the permissibility of standing guard for a person of importance. Because typically this is not allowed. Our Prophet ﷺ has forbidden uh, a Muslim ruler from sitting down and everybody rising in his presence. This is the general rule, right? And he said anybody who likes this, he should be prepared to sit in the fire of hell. Or be prepared to meet Allah Azza or so to meet the punishment of Allah in the fire of hell. Right? So we learn that the general rule, we know this, that when somebody comes in or when somebody is sitting down of importance, you don't stand up as a token of respect. We know this. However, in Hudaybiyah, what happened? When the emissaries came, Al Mughira, Abu Bakr, others are all standing with their swords ready. And Ibn Qayyim remarks that they did this. As a show of force, even though it was not the habit of the Prophet to have an armed guard, it was not his habit to have an entourage, it was not his habit to have the elite, you know, bodyguard. That's not his habit. He didn't have it. But at Hudaybiyah, this took place. Why? To show the Quraysh that the Muslims respect their leader even more than you guys respect your leaders. To show them basically the protocol that they're accustomed to. Right? There's a protocol that is, uh, uh, that is uh, accepted. There's a protocol that is known. And if the Sahaba had all been sitting down you know, in haphazard fashion, the emissaries of the Quraysh would have understood, you're not going to do anything for, the, for your leader. So to demonstrate that respect, the way they are accustomed to it. So in this case, it is allowed for uh, a maslaha for a particular uh, reason. Also of the theological benefits we learn, and I talked about this in a lot of detail, is the issue of al-fa'al. And what is al-fa'al? Who can remind me? Optimism. Optimism. Also good omens. Al-fa'al, good omens, right? We read in something positive. And what are the two conditions of al-fa'al being legitimate? Everybody should know. The two conditions. Oh, note takers. In the name of Allah. That it's true, how do you know it's true? So if it doesn't come to pass, it's not true. That's not the condition. If something is good, you'll take it as a good sign. So number one, it's a good omen, not a bad omen. Not true. It's good, positive. It's a positive omen. There's no such thing as negative. Bad luck doesn't exist. Positive omen. Something optimistic, number one. And number two is what? You link it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You link it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? That you say this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if these two conditions are met, you may read in a positive sign. And the most common type of reading in is by something you hear, but you can also do by something you see. So you hear the name of somebody, you hear a positive sentence, right? Then you read in something positive. And the Prophet ﷺ, when Suhail came, he said, قَدْ سَهُلَ أَمْرُكُمْ So from Suhail, he derived a positive omen that now Allah is sending the ease. This is going to be the ease. Everything was an impasse. So we learn from here the point of uh, Al-Fa'l. Also, there was a hadith I didn't mention related to Hudaybiyah. I'll just quickly mention it about theological benefits. That at one point in time in Hudaybiyah, it rained very severely. One of those, uh, they were camped for around uh, 20 days or so. Uh, and so one of those days it rained very severely. And the next day, uh, the rumor started spreading that from the days of Jahiliyyah they would have a, a custom that they would say it rained because of such and such a star. They'd have a, a pre-Islamic custom. Because of such and such a star, it rained. Right? So 
apparently one or two people said something of this nature. After Salat al-Fajr, the Prophet ﷺ said, do you know what Allah said last night? They said, what? He said, Allah said, some of my believers have woken up believing in me, and some of them have woken up believing in the stars and rejecting me. So those who said it has rained because of the star have rejected me and believed in the star. And those who said it has rained because of the blessings of Allah and the rahmah of Allah are believers in me and rejectors in the stars. Now, a uh, lot of theology here, but we don't have time for this, just a very briefly. So the Arabs had a superstitious custom in the pre-Islamic days that they would attribute rain to a particular star or a season or a time of the month. A time of the, you know, it, 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 it rained because of such and such a cycle of the moon or such and such, such a, a, a star. And uh, we have similar things in our times. We have a good luck stone. We have these types of things. We have similar types of things. Every culture has it. So apparently one of them remarked this in the passing that, oh, it rained because it's the star's turn now. It's that star's turn. It's now, tonight is the, 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 the you know, zodiac sign, whatever it might be. That's that particular point. And there's no doubt that when the Sahaba said this, they did not mean it in their hearts because they're believers. So when you say this without meaning it, this becomes minor shirk. But when you say it and you mean it, this is major shirk, right? And so, when we ascribe any blessing, we need to ascribe it directly to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are not allowed to ascribe blessings to other than Allah. So, we do not say, oh, I was sick, but the doctor cured me. We do not say, oh, that house was under fire, but the firemen saved the house. This is inappropriate to say. How do we phrase it? We say, I was sick, but then Allah cured me through the efforts of the doctor. The house was on fire, but then Allah saved the house through the efforts of the fireman. Right? So we link it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the proper adab with Allah. We don't just link it to secondary causes or to even direct causes. We believe in causality. Causality means you throw a stone, it's going to break the window. Right? Believe it or not, some Muslim groups did not believe in causality. We believe in causality, but we don't ascribe blessings uh, except to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We say, Allah azza wa jal cured us through the medicine of the doctor. So we ascribe it to Allah, and this is proven in this hadith. You don't say, it rained because of the star. And that's what we uh, uh, you know, um, extract from this point which occurred in the incident of Hudaybiyah. Also in the incident of Hudaybiyah, the theological issue of tabarruk. With the remnants of the Prophet ﷺ, tabarruk means to seek blessings. We clearly have seen in, in Hudaybiyah that uh, Suhail ibn Amr narrated that the Prophet's wudu, that even his spit, that we know in other hadith, his sweat, his hair, all of this was used to, ga to gain blessings from. And this is something that is clearly allowed and nobody can deny this except somebody who's ignorant or somebody who's arrogant. It's clearly allowed that we seek blessings from the body and the sweat and the remnants of the water and the hair of the Prophet ﷺ, but it is only allowed for him and not for anybody else. No other person is of that level that we go behind him and seek his barakah and blessings, that we kiss his hand thinking that we're going to get blessings from him, that we get his turban and we think it's a great honor he's given me his turban as some of the other groups have it. No, it is only the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu that it is allowed to uh, do tabarruk with uh, the remnants and of course there are no remnants of his in our times but uh, the Sahaba they would use uh, that uh, in their times. And also by the way there's an authentic hadith that uh, when he saw them take all of this water and all of this he said why are you doing this? So they said, because we want to receive Allah's blessings. He said, whoever wishes that Allah and His Messenger love him, let him be truthful in his speech, trustworthy in his amana, and let him not irritate his neighbors. This hadith is in Tabarani. And what this means is what? When they said, we want to get blessed by your remnants of the water, he's not saying that's wrong. It is right. But he said, you really want to get blessings? Then speak truthfully. And be honest in your interactions. And make sure your neighbors love you and don't hate you. So he's basically telling them a better tactic and a better reward, even though it is allowed. But he said, if you want Allah and His Messenger to love you, then follow this uh, tactic. 
also of the greatest benefits of uh, Hudaybiyah is the issue of Qadr. And that is that sometimes things happen and we don't understand why they happen. And on surface it appears nothing but wrong, chaos, evil, harm. And yet Allah knows and we do not know. And one of the fundamentals of Qadr is to resign your fate over to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It happens, it happens. And you expect the best from Allah. As Allah says, وَعَسَىٰ أَن تَكْرَهُ شَيْءٍ وَهُوَ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ You might hate something, but it is good for you. In another verse, it is possible you hate something, but Allah will bring much good coming from that which you hate. وَيَجْعَلْ اللَّهُ فِي خَيْرًا كَثِيرًا A lot of good will come from that thing that you hate. And this is the perfect example here. That the Sahaba did not understand. We see the reaction of Umar. Even the Prophet did not know what to say other than I'm obeying Allah. Allah will help me. He doesn't know how. At the time, he doesn't know how. What does he tell Umar? Allah will help me. But he doesn't understand how. Because at face value, it really seems like a humiliation after every single point. But in the end, we will see, we already have mentioned last week, and we'll see over again, Hudaybiyah was the greatest victory since the beginning of Islam. In terms of conquest, in terms of, uh, in terms of converts, in terms of the conquest of Mecca, it's a victory and a victory and a victory. But when it happens, who knows? So this is a fundamental point we derive, and that is uh, Qadr, uh, belief in Qadr. Also a theological benefit uh, from the, the incident of Hudaybiyah, a very important benefit is Never, ever, ever assume you know better than the Qur'an and Sunnah. We have statements from Umar ibn al-Khattab, from Suhail ibn Hanif, the both of them, they said, اتَّهِمُ الرَّأْيَ عَلَى الدِّينِ Accuse your own opinion before you accuse the religion. Accuse your own understanding before you accuse the Qur'an and Sunnah. And he also said, the, the famous statement, that if any other person had told me to do that, I would never have accepted. But it's because it's the process I accepted. If any other Amir had told me that I'm supposed to hand the Muslims back, I would never have done that. So you see how close he is. But he realizes in the end you have to submit. And this, obviously this only applies when there's an explicit text of the Quran and Sunnah. You do not say, I think, when Allah and His Messenger have spoken. You do not say my opinion when Allah Azza wa Jal has clearly expressed His opinion because His opinion is fact, your opinion is dhan. It is completely wrong. So when the Quran and Sunnah is explicit, سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا And this is demonstrated in the treaty of, in the incident of Hudaybiyah. Also, a very interesting theological uh, tangent which I did not bring up. I was wondering should I bring it up or not, but I said what the heck, subhanAllah, let's just go ahead and mention all of the details, right? Very interesting thing happened in the 4th century of the Hijrah related to the incident of Hudaybiyah. And that is what? A huge controversy erupted in Andalus over the fact or the question, did the Prophet ﷺ read and write or not? And one of the most famous scholars of Andalus, his name is Abu Walid al-Baji, great scholar of Maliki fame, every Faqih and every Maliki student of knowledge knows this name. He's a very famous Maliki scholar. He's from Andalus. Abu, and he wasn't the only one, Abu Dhar al-Harawi and, um, uh, and uh, the other one as well, I forgot his name. Uh, a number of scholars, they followed him in this. They began to claim that the Prophet ﷺ can read and write. And this spread amongst the masses. And other scholars got involved and they said, anybody who says that the Prophet ﷺ can read and write is a kafir. You know the problem of calling different people kafir? It's not just in Pakistan. It actually happens all over, right? It's a common thing. And it happens all the way even in Andalusia. That they said anybody who says that the Prophet can read and write, he's a kafir. Why? According to the other group, and that's the majority, uh, at least they said that he cannot read and write. And that's also my opinion, he cannot read and write. Even though I don't make takfir of Al-Baji, but they made takfir of him. And they said, why? Why do you think they made takfir of him? It what? It's mentioned in the Quran. What is mentioned in the Quran? An Nabi al Ummi. The unlettered Prophet. So they said anybody who says he can read and has rejected the Quran, he's a kafir. So there was a actual court case that was brought against Abu Walid al Baji, who was the most famous scholar of his time. And the Sultan had to get involved. He was brought in front of the Sultan and uh, 
he was basically said, look, your, your, uh, all of your other ulama are accusing you of being a kafir because you've rejected the Qur'an, because you say the Prophet can read and write. So he said, I have clear evidences that he can read and write. He said what? Number one evidence, hadith in Sahih Bukhari, incident of Hudaybiyah. That when Ali ibn Abi Talib refused to erase Muhammad Rasulullah, one version in Bukhari, and this is literally what it says, the Prophet took the kitab and he did not, wala yahsin al kitaba. He didn't know how to write. Wa kataba Muhammad ibn Abdullah. So it clearly says he took the book, he didn't, meaning the scroll, and he didn't know how to write, and he wrote Muhammad ibn Abdullah. Because you know the thing of Muhammad Rasulullah and Ali said, I'm not going to delete that. You know, the, remember that, right? So the virgin in Bukhari clearly says he didn't know how to read and write, and he wrote. This is what we have agreed to, and then the treaty, go, the hadith goes on. So he said, this is an explicit hadith. He didn't know how to write, and he wrote. They said, how about a Nabi al ummi He said, a Nabi al ummi was when he became a prophet, before he was a prophet. After he learned how to read and write. So Allah describes him in the early stage. And then the later stage went... There's no reason for him not to read and write. He learned how to read and write. So they said, how about the verse in the Quran? Uh, that you never uh, recited any book before this. Nor did you ever write with your right hand. Write with your right hand. And you never wrote with your right hand. So they said this ayah is very clear. He said, this ayah is an evidence for me and against you. Why? Because it says, وَمَا كُنْتَ تَتْلُو مِنْ قَبَلِهِ From before the revelation of the Qur'an, you didn't recite a book or write. Which means, مفهوم المخالفة for those who know Usul al-Fiqh, after the Qur'an was revealed, you did learn how to read and write. So, and he quoted other evidences, I have already confused you enough, I don't want to confuse you more than this. Believe me, they could not defeat him. They could not. Because he brought for everything that they said, he brought an evidence. And in the end, the case was dismissed because he had legitimate Quranic evidences and Sunnah evidences. That they could not say that this is kufr, he's not rejecting. And this clearly shows us that you can have some strange opinions and still not be a kafir. And it is up to the ulama. It is up to the ulama, it's not up to the lay people. The lay people do not and are not qualified to decide who's a Muslim and who's not a Muslim. It is up to the ulama, the scholars of theology especially, to know what is kufr and what is not kufr. Right? And the masses should not get involved in deciding who's a kafir and who's not a kafir. This is something the ulama do. So in the end the case was dismissed and the position he held it till he died. Uh, but it remained a minority position and later scholars they wrote entire treatises on this issue to refute him, and the fact of the matter is that uh, the evidences are mutawatir, that he was a Nabi al-Ummi, that he did not read and write, and as for the version in Bukhari that says he did not know how to read and write, there's two interpretations to, uh, and then he wrote, there's two interpretations, the first of them, and that's a minority opinion as well, he wrote his name only, and they say, most people who don't know how to read and write, they can write their name, this is an opinion. But the second opinion is inshallah the stronger one because we would like to stick to the Qur'an when it says an al ummi and we would like to stick to the Qur'an when it says that you never wrote with your hand even though it says min qablihi but it doesn't mean min ba'dihi you did. Mafum al-mukhalaf is not a very strong istidlal for those who know Surah al-Fiqh. Uh, and they say the Prophet ﷺ did not write, but he commanded somebody to write, and this is allowed in any language. We say, the governor rebuilt the city. In English we'll say, the, the, the president, well not the president in this case, especially the government's closed, not going to do anything these days. The, 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 let's say the governor rebuilt the highway. Okay? The governor rebuilt the highway. We all understand the governor God forbid he would actually ever work, but I mean, you know, physically, he's not going to go to the trenches and dig the highway, is he? But when we say the governor rebuilt the highway, what do we mean? He commanded the rebuilding of the highway. 
right? It is allowed to speak in this type of language when it's the leader involved. So he took the book, he took the scroll, and he didn't know how to write, but he commanded somebody to write. And so this is the other opinion that is given, okay? Let's leave it to the end, inshallah. You know, so, in any case, the majority position, which is the safer one in any case, is that uh, he did not know how to read and write. Nonetheless, I found this interesting that we should just bring this up with Hudaybi. Okay, these are the theological benefits. Now move on to the third section of benefits. What's the third section of benefits? No. Fiqh benefits. Fiqh benefits from the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, from the incident of Hudaybiyah. Fiqh benefits. The most obvious fiqh benefit the most blatant fiqh benefit, the permissibility of engaging in peace treaties with an otherwise evil enemy. The worst enemy imaginable. The Quraysh were not neutral. The Quraysh were not pacifist Ahl Kitab. The Quraysh were not people that were freedom and democracy and whatnot. The Quraysh were the worst enemies the Ummah has ever seen. We will never have a worse enemy than the Quraysh. Why? Because Nobody is actually opposing the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, other than the Quraysh. Anytime another group, another nation, another country opposes Muslims, they're not opposing the Prophet directly. Correct? The only people who actually opposed the one man whom Allah sent to them. Everybody else, we are not the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, when an enemy attacks us. Uh, even if they attack us for Islam, and we have had plenty of attacks in the last 14 centuries, they're not attacking the Prophet directly. But the Quraysh, they attacked him directly. They tried to kill him directly. They expelled him directly. What greater zulm and what greater injustice is that? Yet still, the Prophet wasallam engaged with them directly and had a peace treaty with them. And this shows us that even the most evil and the most vile and the most crooked and the most corrupt and the most, you know, literally, literally the most evil people. You can engage in peace treaties with them. And here the scholars have differed that does this mean that there's a maximum of 10 years or not? Imam Shafi'i from the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, he said, the maximum is 10 years, but you can keep on renewing as much as you want. But it has to be only 10 year increments, right? So the maximum for the Khalifa, and this is of course for the Khalifa, the Khalifa is allowed to engage in a peace treaty for 10 years with an evil enemy, then after 10 years he has to have another treaty, then another treaty, and he can do that, but he cannot extend more than 10 years. But Abu Hanifa and the uh, Riwai of Imam Ahmed and others, they say, look, 10 years was just what the Prophet them did, you want to have more, you want to have less, there is no uh, limit, and inshallah that is really the, the, the strongest position, that it depends on the circumstances of the time. Just because the Prophet said 10 doesn't mean that's the max. You can have whatever is the political circumstance for this time. And in fact, some modern scholars in modern uh, times, uh, very famous fuqaha, Dr. Wahba al-Zuhaili, that famous scholar uh, uh, from Syria, and also uh, Sheikh al-Qardawi as well, uh, they have basically held positions that are unique for our times. And they say, in light of current circumstances, in light of the modern world, we can in fact extrapolate that there can be permanent peace. Not just five years, ten years, we can actually have permanent peace. If that is the way the world is expected to be, then we can have permanent peace. And this is uh, an, op an opinion that is also mentioned in our time. So this is the main fiqh point that is derived. Another uh, fiqh point that is derived is that uh, even though vulgarity and cursing is typically haram, there are some very, very, very specific scenarios where it in fact becomes allowed. And Abu Bakr's vile curse, it's a very vulgar curse. And to be honest, I did not even translate it properly out of respect. Otherwise, it is even more vulgar than what I said. Right? Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't worry, I'm not doing it. Okay? But uh, the fact that somebody as otherwise shy and, you know, mu'addab, you know, full of adab as Abu Bakr, he utters such a curse in a state of anger to get a point across to somebody who's just insulted Islam and him and the Prophet ﷺ. It shows us that there are some very minor exceptions to this rule because the Prophet ﷺ didn't criticize or, or, or get angry at Abu Bakr afterwards. Also, we learn from this of the fiqh that we learn is that the one who cannot continue Hajj and Umrah, he stops. He's called uh, the Muhsir. He stops. Ihsar means you're, you, you basically stop from going for Hajj and Umrah. He stops where he is. He, uh, he uh, sacrifices the animal. He shaves his hair uh, or trims his hair. And then he can resume his normal uh, life. And this is something that we learn from the Treaty of uh, Hudaybiyah. Also we learn for the very first time 
uh, that the rulings for ihram, you can get out of them for a legitimate reason. And this is something I didn't mention before, but Ka'b ibn Ujra, one of the companions, suffered from a major uh, medical issue, and that was that he was infested with lice. And it was causing a lot of irritation, and he was sick and whatnot. And when the Prophet ﷺ saw him, he said, Subhanallah, why didn't you tell me that it was this bad? Shave your hair off. This is while he's in Ihram, while they're still waiting for the Hudaybiyah. The, the, the treaty has not been signed yet. So they think they're still going for the Umrah. So he said, shave your hair off, because the life is in the hair. Shave your hair off, and then give a fidya. Give a fidya. Feed or, or fast or whatever you can do, give a fidya. So, in Ihram, if you have a medical issue because of which you need to wear actual clothes, let's say, right? Uh, classic example, uh, you know, the elderly, they have a bladder problem, let's say. Okay, they need to wear something to protect themselves. They cannot wear the ihram. Completely legit. They must do this. And then they give a fidya. Feeding the people or, or whatever. Or they can sacrifice an animal if they want. So any legitimate reason for breaking from the ihram, you're allowed to do that. And then you give the fidya. This is what we learn from the incident of Hudaybiyah. We also learn from the incident of Hudaybiyah. The Ibn al-Qayyim mentions this. The permissibility of seeking the help of a pagan, of an idol worshipper, even in extremely sensitive matters. And he gets this from, uh, if you remember, Bisir, uh, Ibn Sufyan al-Khuza'i, uh, or Bishr, both are mentioned, Bisir and Bishr, both are mentioned as his name. Remember the very first envoy, or spy, if you like, that the Prophet ﷺ sent. According to Ibn al-Qayyim, he was a mushrik. And so he says, from this we derive the permissibility of hiring out, or renting, or trusting a mushrik against fellow mushrikeen, if we really know this person. However, other scholars say Bishr was in fact a new Muslim and a convert and a secret Muslim. And so there's a bit of a controversy, was Bishr a Muslim or not? In my, in my uh, seerah, I took the line, he was a Muslim three weeks ago. Now I'll just mention, there is a controversy. And again, I re reiterate, my seerah is not advanced, advanced, because that would really take us as it is. So it's intermediate, so sometimes they just gloss over things. I'll now go back and say, there's a bit of a controversy, was Bishr a Muslim or not? I taught you that he was a secret convert, and this is what many people, inshallah, this seems to be the stronger opinion. However, Ibn al-Qayyim felt he was a pagan. Even if we don't take this story as evidence, the evidence is still there. That in the Hijrah, in the Battle of Uhud, in many other places, the Prophet actually got the help of a pagan that was trustworthy. So it is allowed to seek help of a non-Muslim enemy against other enemies if you trust this enemy. If you trust him for whatever reason uh, might be. And this is clearly, inshallah, the case uh, in the seerah. Also we learn from the fiqh benefits of the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, the permissibility of being strictly literal about a treaty, even if it means you contradict the spirit of the treaty. As long as you don't contradict the letter of the treaty. You're not contradicting the treaty. Where do we learn this from? Women. Women migrating. Women migrating. Right? Because the treaty said, no man shall come. And it's understood when you say generically man, with all respect to the feminists and whatnot, it is understood that when you say man, you mean woman as well. But in this case, the Sahaba, the Prophet they stuck by the letter, even if it meant the spirit is lost. Right? As long as you do not contradict the letter of the treaty, then this is something that is permissible. And also we have another evidence here, and that is that uh, the Prophet was told that you're not going to allow somebody to live in your midst, but he was not told it's your job to send them back. Correct? So, he waited for the Quraysh. He was not told it's your job to enforce, correct? So he didn't enforce. So much so, when Abu Basir came back again, the Prophet ﷺ just spoke to the air and said, what a great soldier is Abu Basir, if only there was somebody to help him. Right? Meaning you had better get out before I'm forced to draw my hand. Right? So he actually allowed him the opportunity to go. And this clearly shows us that, look, he was not obliged to fulfill the handing over of the Muslims, and therefore he didn't do that. The Quraysh did not put him upon him, and he did not do that. So this clearly shows us that uh, you, you, as long as you follow the literal letter of the law, and you don't contradict the stipulation, you are safe in this regard. Also, we have over here an incident that took place. I already said that it rained uh, severely in one of the days of Hudaybiyah, and the day that it rained, Maghrib and Isha was not prayed in Jama'ah. In fact, the Adhan was given, 
And when the Adhan time said, Hayya ala salah and Hayya ala al falah, the Mu'adhan did not say that. And the Adhan was changed. And we are to this day supposed to change the Adhan in Muslim lands. When the people hear the Adhan, we're supposed to change the Adhan when the people cannot come to the masjid. And we say, Sallu fi buyutikum instead of Hayya ala salah. Or in this case, the Mu'adhan said, Sallu fi rihalikum, pray in your tents. And so the Sahaba prayed in their tents because it was raining so bad. And they did not pray in jama'ah. And this shows us that at times of difficulty, uh, and this is very true by the way, and I, we have had cancellations of our seerah and salah years ago when there's a hurricane or a tornado warning or whatnot, we say no. No, we should not come. When I was in Connecticut as well, severe, uh, um, th uh, severe winter, I mean um, snow falling and whatnot, plenty of times you'll get an email that, okay, no salah today. Even there is time, subhanAllah, remember, I didn't pray Jumu'ah, and I stayed at home, and my khutbah was in the masjid, and the masjid is 10 minutes away. But there was a blizzard coming, and the blizzard got worse and worse and worse. By 11 a.m., khalas, we said, no Jumu'ah. Right? Because this is the sunnah. You don't put your life in jeopardy, driving to the masjid in that type of circumstance, and then, no, no, this is not the way. Sallu fi buyutikum, sallu fi rihalikum. And we learn this from uh, Hudaybiyyah as well. Also, we learn... But let us not act too much upon this point that we learn, as that is, if you oversleep Fajr, right? Let's not overact too much on this. But if once in a lifetime, as it happened to the Prophet or maybe twice because there's an ikhtilaf as we said, some say this happened twice and some say it happened once, even if it happened twice, subhanAllah, for some of us it happens twice a week or twice a month, astaghfirullah, you know, may Allah Azza wa Jal forgive us, it happened to the Prophet maybe max twice in his lifetime, both of the times on a jihad expedition. Never once in Makkah and Medina did he oversleep, never once. Right? And even I say in this there is great rahmah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because wallahi the best of us this happens to us once in a while. The best of us it happens and yani, we shouldn't feel proud of it but we should realize it's human. That is something once in a while that happens. Ask Allah's forgiveness and then pray to raka'ah as soon as you can. So we learn this from the uh, incident of Hudaybiyah. Okay, with this we now get to the final uh, benefits from Hudaybiyah and perhaps the most controversial ones. And this is modern political thought. I had mentioned when I started Hudaybiyah that my very first Sira lecture ever was about Hudaybiyah. Before I ever spoke about the whole seerah, I concentrated on two stories only. And I gave those quite a while here and there. And still, I think online, I think still the audio or something might still be there. I don't think it was recorded in video. And this is the uh, late 90s or early 2000s. This is quite a while ago. And the two stories were the Treaty of Hudaybiyah and the Slander of Aisha. That for me, these two stories were the most intriguing, each one for, for personal and, and, and political reasons. And this one, the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, uh, I felt it's very relevant. Actually, it is not late 90s, it's early 2000s, because it was post-2001, uh, right, post-9-11. I gave this post-9-11, and that is the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. Because the fact of the matter is we are living in very, very difficult times. We are living in Akhir zaman really. There's no question that we're the end of times here. And there are so many problems, internal Muslim problems. The people are far from the religion. The rulers, yani hadith wala haraj, they are as they are. You know, to make matters worse, uh, you know, uh, there are external problems as well. Non-Muslim governments that are uh, affecting policies that are harming the ummah. Uh, policies that are political. Uh, policies that are economic. You know, policies that are uh, military. You know, so, so many things going on. The creation of Israel and the taking away of the, the you know land of Palestine from the people who owned it, uh, the economic policies, anybody who studies what the International Monetary Fund is doing, the IMF, and how it subjugates third world countries and you know especially you know poor and Muslim countries with giving them large loans and then when they cannot repay, then they start subjugating them with cheap uh, exportation of their goods. Wallahi, this is like highway robbery, you know, and that's why many many non-Muslims are protesting against the IMF and what, what it does. Because and this is just blatant, you know, uh, criminal, if you like, behavior that's taking place. But, you know, this is the reality. And all of us are suffering, at least in the Muslim lands. Economic, if you like. Also military. What happens, you know, in militarily around the world with, you know, drones and the invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan. I mean, these policies, no doubt, are 
adversely affecting many, many Muslims. So much so that it is a common belief in many parts of the Muslim world that the West is engaging in an all-out war, and especially America, they say, is engaged in an all-out war against Islam. This is the belief that many people have, and we know this belief from many people back home. Right, this is the reality that many people view all of these policies as being somehow an all-out war against the religion of Islam itself. And this in turn obviously has caused them to react in many different ways. Uh, many people around the world, Muslim and non-Muslim, all you need to do is look at South America, have a revulsion of America. They hate America for what it has done to them. It's not just a Muslim thing by the way. Look at Venezuela and all of these countries, Nicaragua, there's so much animosity. And by the way, just to tell you guys, wallahi, if you think that Muslim lands have been treated bad, just read what happened in Nicaragua and Venezuela in the 70s, 80s. Go read what, what has happened in those lands. And then you realize that, frankly, you know, most Muslim lands have not had it as bad as those countries have had it. In terms of American policies, and you know, Chomsky is one of the greatest people to talk about this. That's in fact, going to my tangents here, that's how Chomsky rose to fame in political thought when he criticized South American policy uh, by America. Nonetheless, let's get, get, get back to our point here. So, all of this has caused a lot of people to react in different ways, some of them verbally, and a small group of them, extremely militant reaction. And the classic example is Al-Qaeda. And th this group, it claims that it is the universal duty of every Muslim to fight against the great Taghut of our times. And many of them say it is haram. This is where we get practical now. It is haram for us as American Muslims to remain in this land. It's not allowed for us to be living here. It's not allowed for us to be paying taxes because they say that uh, this is not faithful to the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that uh, you, are, you're, you are doing something which is haram. Now much can be said, much is said, I myself have said a lot in this regard, you can you know, see this on YouTube and whatnot, uh, and I have given a lot of lectures about this point, uh, but, and, and I, I don't have time to reiterate all of these now, we're talking about Hudaybiyah now, uh, but I give a num I've given a number of lectures uh, online, and I can reference them uh, later on, and it can, you, can, you can listen to them uh, online. But now I just want to mention that, I mean just for your information, I do not view American foreign policy as a war directed against Islam per se. This is not my opinion at all. Yes, Muslims around the world are suffering as a result of foreign policy. But, in my humble analysis, agree or disagree, if the lands that had oil in them were Buddhist, if Palestinians were Jains or Confucianists, it would not have changed American foreign policy that much. America does what it does because it thinks this is in its self-interest, in its economic interest, in its financial interest. And yes, there are lobby groups within America that are pushing certain agendas. And yes, it helps that we are the brown other. It helps. It would have been more difficult if it was a white Christian civilization, no doubt. But in essence, in my humble opinion, and I believe most people who study political science would agree with this, what America is doing, it is doing not because they want to destroy Islam, but because they feel this is better for them to do for whatever reason. Economically, politically, militarily, strategically, it's not something that is directly meant to attack the religion of uh, Islam. And Allah knows best, that's really not the point here. The point here is that we, as American Muslims, or Western Muslims to be even broader, we're accused of doing that which is haram, of preferring our American identity over our Islamic identity, of loving a country above loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I seek Allah's refuge, and I know all of you do as well, from ever putting my wala of Allah, my loyalty to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, above, uh, or secondary, sorry, to any other loyalty. We believe that our loyalty to Allah and His Messenger is the ultimate loyalty. And I just gave a, a recent lecture at Isna, which is just three weeks ago, or well, last month. I gave a recent lecture at Isna uh, about uh, the reality of being uh, a Muslim in America and, and speaking uh, power, uh, uh, truth to power. And you can listen to that. We're very explicit in this point. However, let's get relevant here. What does Hudaybiyah do? Hudaybiyah shows us that it is allowed for different factions and portions of the Ummah to have different political treaties and different alliances with those who are, without a doubt, the Quraysh, pure enemies of Allah and His Messenger. 
you can still have treaties and alliances with them. How much more so then, when there is no khilafah, when the current countries we're talking about, they might not actually be fighting for the sake of religion. This is my opinion. They're not fighting for religion. They're not even religious people by and large. Sure, there's the odd general and the governor and whatnot that are, you know, fundamentalists, whatnot, but by and large, American foreign policy does not stem from the Bible. It doesn't stem from their understanding of the New Testament. It doesn't stem from their love of Jesus Christ. It stems from their love of power and money. That's what it stems from. Right? And this is, I think, the analysis of most of us in this room, and I think, frankly, anybody who studies uh, you know, modern political science. So, put all of this together, the point being that from Hudaybiyah we learn, it is allowed to have alliances and treaties with some nations, with some political entities, even if that nation or that entity is harming or persecuting or even killing some Muslims. Can you imagine the personal pain, the anguish, the grief of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi as he sees Abu Jandal, as Abu Jandal himself with blood and chain saying, you're going to return me back to them and I just came here? Put yourself in the shoes of the Muslims there. Put yourself in that camp right then and there. That's why Umar lost it. He couldn't, just could not fathom this, right? How can we return this guy? But... There are benefits that outweigh the personal harms. And sometimes sacrifices needed to be, need to be made in order to achieve a greater good. The Muslims in Medina, in fact, the Arabian Peninsula benefited immensely from this treaty. So much so that Allah called it a Fatham Mubina. However, it most certainly did not appear a Fatham Mubina to Abu Basir and Abu Jandal when it happened. When it happened, there's clearly no way they're going to say this is Fatah Mubina. It seems like nothing but humiliation. And in our times, we don't have Abu Jandal, we don't have Abu Basir. We have the prisoners of Guantanamo. We have tens of thousands of Afghani families, Iraqi civilians that have been killed. Tens of thousands of innocent, nameless men, women and children that have been killed in drones. Hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions as a result of the sanctions throughout the 90s, right? And the list goes on and on and on. These are our Abu Basis and Abu Jandas. And our heart bleeds for them. And we're very, very angry at the injustices that caused their death. No doubt, in the end of the day, we believe, and many scholars believe, that it is permissible, it is allowed to engage in these types of treaties, for the sake of some good. What is that good? What is that benefit? This is something that we have to discuss and, and, and debate amongst the scholars. And I believe that in light of the current circumstances, in light of the circumstances of the world, the political circumstances of Muslim lands, the reality is that we living here in these lands are afforded the opportunity to worship Allah and to benefit other people financially and in our teachings and in our da'wah in ways that even if we were in a Muslim land we could not do. And this is something most of you in this room personally realize. Frankly, most of you that came here as immigrants were not anywhere near as practicing as you are now. This is a reality you yourselves as a, most of you, and there must be exceptions, most of you. Coming here rekindle your own faith. It made you more committed to the faith. Many of you came from lands back in the 70s and 80s. You could not practice your faith at all. Especially our Arab brethren that came from certain lands in the 70s and 80s. You couldn't do a fraction of what you're doing now. And currently as we speak, there are on the conservative side at least, at least 50 million Muslims living in Western democracies. Western, we're not even talking about minorities, because if you're talking about minorities, India is a, a Muslim minority of 100 million people, right? Other lands have, we're not even talking about the Western, Europe, France, Canada, England, America, Australia, at least 50 million Muslims living in these lands. What are we gonna say to these 50 million Muslims? That it's wajib for you to leave, go where? Which land will take them? Which country will accept them? There is no khilafah. On top of this, frankly, in my opinion, and you're allowed to disagree, I don't view Western nations as being waging war against the religion. 
I don't view this to be the case. They're waging whatever they're waging for their own pockets, for their greed. And it just so happens that one of the targets is those who are Muslim, but we're not the only target, by the way. Anybody who thinks this really does not know. As I said, look at Nicaragua, look at Venezuela, look at Vietnam. Have we forgotten Vietnam in the 70s? Right? What happened over there? Look at, you know, Russian state. It's not Korea, right? Have we forgotten what's happening in those places? Napalm bombings, right? It's not just us. This is the reality of an empire. It's the, it's the hubris that every republic feels, uh, you know, in, in its time of, of, of glory. And every time of glory is followed by a time of decline. And this, frankly, we always see the beginnings of this happening as well. Right? So, the point being, Western Muslims need to make a decision. Do they wish to enter into such a contract, such a treaty with these governments? In return for certain rights and privileges, many of which are not available back home, quote unquote, back home for some of us. For me, as I say, I was born here. And we also make a distinction. Those Muslims who were born and raised here, where do you, even more so, where do you expect them to go? Right? Even more so, what nationality do they have? Which land will take them? What is to happen of 50 million Muslims? So, the Treaty of Hudaybiya teaches us that it is allowed for Muslims to have different political treaties. Not all Muslims have to have the exact same treaty. And what might be allowed for one group is not allowed for another. What might be allowed for one group might be haram for another. And so for Western Muslims to be living in this land, with the visa, with the passport, this is the treaty. You cannot obtain the visa or the passport without having an understanding. And what is that understanding? You're going to be a law-abiding citizen. That's the understanding. You're not going to break the law. You're not going to be treacherous. You're not going to do something that's going to uh, you know, go against the, the, the security of the land. If you have such a visa and such a passport, well then, the laws become binding even if you see Abu Basir and Abu Jandal and you cannot help them. You make dua for them. And you say, oh Allah Azza wa Jal will make a way out for you. Now, somebody will say, Hudaybiyah was unique for the Prophet ﷺ. Who are you to say this is Fatham Mubina? Right? Who are you to say a treaty with a particular entity is a victory? And so they say, and I've been told this when I gave the, the, this talk previously, one of the overzealous Shemani brothers, he basically said, Hudaybiyah was khas for the Prophet ﷺ. Unique for him only. Nobody else can engage in a treaty with a non-Muslim other than the Prophet ﷺ. And I said to him, this attitude will destroy the whole seerah. Because everything is only for him then. The general rule, anything the Prophet ﷺ does, is something he's doing for us as an ummah. Then he said there are differences between our situation and Hudaybiyah. I said, and do you think in any situation in the world, if you compare it to the seerah, it's going to be 100% the same? Of course it's going to be different. There are certain things that are worse, there are certain things that are better. But the concept, what, would it, what are we extracting? Number one, that different Muslim groups have, ha, can have different treaties. What the Prophet ﷺ could not do, Abu Basir and Abu Jandal could do. And that is attack the caravans of the Quraysh. Right? He could not do that. Umar could not do that. But he goes to Abu Jandal, he goes, take my sword. Here, take my sword. He could not do that. Right? But Abu Jandal can. So, this leads us to a very frank issue. And that is that, uh, no doubt, the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, it was from Allah that it is Fatham Mubina. And no other scholar can ever claim that a treaty with a modern land is Fatham Mubina, right? But it is allowed for scholars to make ijtihad. And we will allow the scholars of every era, every society, every place to extrapolate from Hudaybiyah which context, which treaty can be enacted. And I'll be very frank here that yes, if we say that the person with the visa and the passport cannot do certain things, that, is, that does not mean the whole Muslim world cannot do them. Rather, I have been very clear here that it's not my job to speak about what other societies should or should not do. I am an American, born and raised here. I am living in this land. I have only one nationality. I speak to American Muslims specifically and then the broader Western Muslims indirectly. As for Muslims living in other lands, there is no doubt that anybody who sees his country invaded by a foreign army that if he defends his country and his land and his property from a foreign army, who can criticize him? And I have never in my life spoken about that issue. What I am speaking about, somebody who has citizenship, somebody who has visa, they are not allowed to keep that citizenship and visa and then do something treacherous. 
No matter how much Abu Basirs and Abu Jandals they see, no matter how much Guantanamo and drones, and that's why I'm being very blunt here, that those of our, you know, some 0.00001% of our youth that are enticed into this type of stuff, that are listening to this type of, of rhetoric, frankly, we need to tell them, study the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. And realize that sometimes there is a broader benefit. In this case, 50 million Muslims in the West. In this case, there is no Khilafah that you can migrate to. In this case, the enemy that you want to attack is a, a, a billion times stronger than you. If you pick them with a pin, they, a, a, a pin they're going to throw back an atom bomb at you. You have to be very careful about who are you playing with over here. Nonetheless, I say very explicitly, what other societies do, that's between them and their scholars. My job and my role, this is a circumstance beyond my control. I was born here, this is my nationality. What I know, what I will speak to is the American context. And I do have to point out here, I mean, somehow this is besides the exact topic, but one of my main criticisms of these extremist or these uh, militant uh, interpretations of Islam, one of my main criticisms, number one, the fact that generally speaking, they do not have scholarship amongst them. Their scholars are do-it-yourself clerics. Their scholars are people who read five, ten books and they think they're experts. By and large, mainstream scholars of all Sunni movements, Deobandi, Tablighi, Salafi, Ahli Hadith, Maliki, Shafi'i, North African, Arab, Saudi, Pakistan, the mainstream scholars, they are opposed to this type of militancy. And if you look at these militant groups, who do they resort to? People that are self-taught, and frankly, the only thing they know how to talk about is jihad, 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 jihad. They never talk about spirituality, and they never talk about you know, issues of other fiqh. They're not experts at all. Jihad is a very deep topic. And to master it, you need to master all the other fields. And we have scholars who have mastered all the fields and the topic of jihad, but they never go back to those scholars. They go back to their own local people, those who have never studied in the tradition, and they are not ulama by and large. And as I said, they are self-taught. Another uh, point that I really criticize these, this group for is that the fact of the matter is that they follow opinions that maybe they'll find one scholar who said this, another scholar that said that, and they'll construct a madhab or a position or a methodology that a basic understanding of the Qur'an and of the Sunnah and of the Seerah, frankly of common sense, will tell us it's not Islamic. You don't need to have an advanced degree in Islamic studies to know that suicide bombing in the middle of a marketplace is ridiculous. You really don't need to have an advanced degree in, in Quranic you know, exegesis to know that you know, blowing up a Shi'i masjid for no reason to, to just to, is something that will bring you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or last week the incident in Kenya. I mean again it's on our minds now. You know, yani Somebody going into a, a shopping mall and literally targeting seven year old kids. Killing a, a Muslim lady for not wearing the hijab. Or, or separating people that are Muslim and non-Muslim gunning them down. SubhanAllah. It's unbelievable. It's bizarre. That these people... I mean, honestly, it really is bizarre. And any time you try to reason with them, immediately, they did this, they did this, they did this, subhanAllah. The people in the bazaar did this. Those children you killed did this. Wallahi, you want to defend your land, defend it against those who are attacking. We would not say anything. People are harming you. People are harming your wife, your child. You have every right to defend against the invading army. But for you to go to a marketplace... For you to go to the shopping center, the bazaar, and start targeting and killing people. And forget the fact that it is un-Islamic completely. How about the common sense? What is the reaction going to be? Let's look at Shabab, what, what they did, right? That after this, the Kenyan government has now unified the support for sending in another force into Somalia. Now the reason why they attacked was that the Kenyan government had sent a force into Somalia. And they said that they had done this, they had done that. I don't doubt at all that an invading army is going to rape and pillage and loot. I don't doubt this. I haven't seen it, I don't doubt it. But you want to respond by going into Kenya and killing innocent men, women and children. What's going to happen? Exactly what happened after 9-11. Exactly what happened after 9-11. You prick a pin and they go back and invade you know, two of your lands, destroy it completely, could bring the economy to a standstill, cause so much chaos in the world, what did you accomplish? Forget the fact it's un-Islamic, use your common sense here, right? And again, this is why I feel the Treaty of Hudaybiyah is so important. That it really tells us, look, don't act with emotion. Don't act with emotion when you see Abu Basir and Abu Jandal. 
Yes, we have Abu Busiz and Abu Jandals. Wallahi, my heart bleeds for our brothers in Guantanamo. Wallahi, it bleeds. I make dua for them. The inhumanity of it is just, it's just sad. How long? Wallahi, these people treat their dogs better than our brothers in Guantanamo. We know this. We know this. What can we do? Make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Make dua to Allah. Make dua to Allah. Make our own lives better. What's happening in all of these other lands? So much is going on. Our heart bleeds for it. But there are times, there are places for the benefit of the ummah, the great, greater ummah. What are you going to do by, as I said, pricking a pin into the tyrant? What are you going to do? Forget the fact that the pin that you prick is actually hurting innocent people, killing innocent people. What is going to happen? What is the backlash? Allah Azza wa Jal will take care. In the meantime, we do what we can. Now again, I want to be clear, I'm speaking to Western and American Muslims. It's not my job to speak to other societies. They decide what is to be done in their lands. For me, what I speak to is, it is not allowed, and this is what I firmly believe, for a person who has a valid visa and a passport. This is, a, uh, this is an amana, this is a contract that you have with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't lie. The mu'min is never a kha'in. The mu'min is never somebody who, who, who's a double-faced uh, uh, traitor. He never ever promises he's going to be peaceful and then he does something else. So the one who has this passport, this treaty, they had better learn the, tre the treaty of Hudaybiyah. And they better understand that. It is allowed for us to engage in peace treaties with somebody or some entity that otherwise is causing great harm uh, to the Muslims and it is never allowed to be treacherous. The final point, I have gone beyond my time but as you see there's a lot of benefits from the Hudaybiyah. Final point, completely uh, irrelevant to the Sirar or Marlul political sauce but of historical interest. Just something, another nukta, another interesting point. In 1994, uh, in 1994, Yasser Arafat, you all know Yasser Arafat, uh, nothing to do with Yasser Qadi, Yasser Arafat. He made a remark uh, in English in South Africa uh, in which he said, this was after the Oslo Treaty that was signed in Norway, if you remember Oslo, uh, in which some Muslims criticized him. How could you have had a treaty with Israel, with the Americans and whatnot? And so he said, I don't see this as any different than the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. If the process could deal with the Quraysh, I can deal with Israel. So he was criticized for this. Okay, now, a few years later, when did Arafat die again? 2004? Okay, I forgot. 2004, okay. Uh, few when he was still alive then. In 1999, somebody whom we all know in this room, but when he wrote this, he was unknown. Daniel Pipes, the leader of the Islamophobes. Daniel Pipes is the leader of the Islamophobes. And frankly, he is the most khabith and dangerous amongst them, out of all of the Islamophobes. Right? And, uh, and one of the reasons is that he, he actually has a little bit of knowledge. He's got a PhD from Harvard in Middle Eastern history. He's the only one who has a shred of knowledge. The rest of them, I mean, Pamela Geller, I mean, honestly, I think her IQ is in the one digits. I mean, you know, like, uh, we, don't, I mean, we don't have to worry about that. But uh, Daniel Pipes, I mean, he really has a little bit. In 1999, the very first signs of who he's going to become, before this, he's unknown. Nakira, Majhul, Ain, nobody knows him. The very first thing he does that shows his nature, his Islamophobia, he writes uh, an article in the Middle Eastern Quarterly uh, called... Al Hudaybiyah and lessons from the Prophet Muhammad's diplomacy. Hence, I'm talking about it now. And typical Daniel Pipes fashion, he claims that he has discovered a secret audio tape of Yasser Arafat in which he has a hidden message for the Muslims. <coughs> it wasn't secret. It wasn't anything, he said this in a public gathering, it was recorded by many people, but this is typical Islamophobia. He said something that was supposed to be completely secret. And this is hidden language, you know they have this notion that Muslims can have the secret language, they have, you know, the code that only Muslims can hear, and non-Muslims are going to go above their heads, right? We are so smart that a billion Muslims can keep a secret. Right? And we can somehow, you know, uh, just give subliminal messages to each other and nobody else will figure out what it is. Right? So Daniel Pipes unlocked the code. What is this cryptography that he unlocked? What is it? That Yasser Arafat said, Oslo is like 
Hudaybi. And he has a seven, eight page article. You can read it. I, I read it a number of times. And uh, yani, the point here he says, and I, I quote directly from the article, that the point of Yasser Arafat saying this, what is the subliminal message to the Muslims? Three points. He summarizes at the end. Number one, he made unpopular concessions that will turn out well in the end, like Hudaybiyah. Number two, he will achieve his goal, though what that goal is remains ambiguous. It might just be the city of Jerusalem in parallel to the city of Mecca in Hudaybiyah. Or it might be the whole of Israel in parallel to the whole Arabian Quraysh dominion. You, re you see what he's doing here, right? That he's re he's what? <laughs> he's reading in Hudaybiyah to Israel. <laughs> Wouldn't that be brilliant? Too brilliant for Yasser Arafat? Believe me, that's exactly what I say. But anyway, it's, 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 it's uh, bizarre. Anyway, so that's the second point. And then the third point, and this is, we're going to come to this uh, in the seerah later on, but this is the key point here for Daniel Pipes and his ilk. And he intends at the right moment, Yasser Arafat, to exploit a minor transgression to attack the enemy. Now, the what? Oh no, this is Hudaybiyah. This is the essence of Hudaybiyah. What is the conquest of Mecca? The Quraysh messed up. And we'll talk about this when we get there. And the Prophet ﷺ used that mess up to attack them. Okay. So, Daniel Pipe says, don't be fooled by the Palestinians. By Yasser Arafat. This is a subliminal message he's sending to the world's billion Muslims. You guys didn't get it. Let me expose it for you the Middle Eastern Quarterly. How did I unlock the code? And that code is, he has no intentions of real peace. He doesn't want real legitimacy. He just wants to use this as a stepping stone to stab us in the back as soon as he's able to. And this was the beginning of uh, Daniel Pipes. Now, frankly, I don't want to go into the issue of Yasser Arafat either defending or criticizing. It's not my expertise and whatnot. I just found it very interesting that Daniel Pipes has this whole article called Hudaybiyah uh, and talks about, you know, the back and forth. Uh, and it's interesting as well how those incidents continue to play out even in modern politics, even in the modern world, 14 centuries ago, right? And now this became, uh, and by the way, when the article was released, it caused a huge controversy. Care uh, made a big issue of it because, I mean, you know, Daniel Pipes, this was the first time Care and Daniel Pipes had a bit of a, uh, you know, spat back and forth. Interesting how something that happened 14 centuries ago has so much relevancy. Inshallah, with this, finally, we come to the end of our entire Treaty of Hudaybiyah. And yes, I did go into extra detail, but I hope you understand why, that I really believe that this is a very pertinent and relevant part of the seerah. And inshallah, from next Wednesday, we will begin talking about the next major incident, and that is the Battle of Khaybar. Time has run out. Keep your questions, inshallah. Next Wednesday, I'll try to break a little bit early, and then we can uh, answer those questions. Wajazakumullahu khayran. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. وحملته في فلكك المشحول يا من أحال النار حول خليله روحا وريحانا بقولك كون